On today's edition of the Locked On Leafs podcast, we discuss where the Leafs sit with 12 games to go in the regular season and what their playoff positioning could look like. And we got a game tonight between the Buds and Devils. We'll tee it up and get you set for it. All of that and more coming up on today's edition of the Locked On Leafs podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On Leafs podcast, a daily Maple Leafs Center podcast Hosted by myself, Mike DiStefano, and my co-host, Dave Morissuti. Today's episode is brought to you by Sleeper. Download the Sleeper app and use the promo code LOCKEDONNHL to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Dave, what is up, my guy? It's been a week. Thank you so much for uh, taking the reins there for, uh, for while I was away. I enjoyed my vacation. And uh, now it's time to get back into the buds for the final stretch run here. 12 games to go. Excited. Yes, it is. It's, it's, it's that time, right? You know, it, it just want to get your inch as you get inching closer and closer to the playoffs. You're just like, all right, we're, we're ready for the big dance here. Some people might not feel that way, but I think most, I think, are, are leaning towards that now. Well, I think it's just interesting because there still is so many questions that need to be answered. Like we did this bit, I, don't know, I think it was after the all star or after the trade deadline, where is what questions need to be answered still? And we we had a bunch of them, um, and I'm not sure if we really have answers to those. Like, do we have an answer to who the least starting goaltender is? I don't believe so. I think Joseph Walls kind of. Crept that door open a little bit, or at least it sounds like it from while I was watching and paying attention from afar last week. You know, we we wondered aloud, what's the deep hair is going to look like? I mean, Dave, the, the, the shock to my system when I saw, you know, all the notifications about TJ Brody being healthy, scratched. I mean, like, I understand he's been playing poor, and, and was it, you know, worth it? I suppose so. Like, he probably deserves it, but it was still pretty shocking to see, and I'm sure you had the same you know, impression when you first heard that it was happening. So like, there's still so many questions that remain. Um, And again, we, we now it's no longer 20 games to get there or 21 games to get there, whatever it was after the, the, the trade deadline, there's only a dozen games now for the least to figure things out. And that's not even to say like, what's Mitch Marner going to look like when he gets back? Well, what's Callie Yarncroft going to look like? When's, what are these guys going to come back? Like uh, there's so much, questions that I still have and it feels like things are starting to even you know the list of questions are starting to grow even more um I think I've missed some things while I was away Dave that maybe can help answer some of that uh or maybe we can kind of go over those things like what what were some of the big notable items over the last week that I missed I'll tell you some of the ones that I kind of know and then you let me know if there was anything else that was kind of big and I guess we could start with the TJ Brody stuff because that was I don't know, one of the bigger items last week, and I didn't get a chance to touch on it, obviously. But I was very surprised to see that happening. And it does now make me question, like, man, what what, what does this team have on the blue line? Like, if they're not willing to play TJ Brody, or if TJ Brody's going to have to play in the third pair, or so, like, what are these deep pairings going to look like? Like, is Benoit now going to get moved up into the top four? Joel Edmondson, is he going to end up being a top four defender now? Uh, it's going to be very interesting what happens if TJ Brody can't find his game between now and game one of the playoffs. I mean, the big one here is you look at how they played against the Oilers. That, to me, um, exemplified exactly how this Leafs team needs to play. Engaged. Brody, right? Brody didn't play that game. He did not play that game, right? So that was the second game he missed. So he first missed the game against Washington. They pretty much rule put out the same wow. lineup against the Oilers. And to me, that was a team that was from start to finish. Obviously, third period, the Oilers got, uh, you know, were pushing to come back in that game. But that was a game there where the Leafs established 
everything right from the start. And it was the physicality. Joel Edmondson, Simone Benoit. Those guys were bringing that edge that, unfortunately, TJ Brody's not that guy. We know that. But he's just that. He's supposed to be that positionally sound guy, you know, breaks up plays, knows where he needs to be. Trustworthy. And, trustworthy. trustworthy. Yeah, exactly. That's the, probably the best way to describe TJ Brody, you know, throughout his time in Toronto. And this year, you just know that that hasn't really f- felt that way about TJ Brody. Like, we haven't been able to really trust him, right? Sure. Has he played with guys who have played well? No, not really. Him and Riley, Dunzo. That's never happening again. <laughs> Him and Lilligran had some oh. success together. Then it kind of fell off a little bit. And to me, when you, for me, it's like when you see Simone Benoit play, he brings the physicality and, you know, a little more confidence in his skating. It's like, how can you take this guy out of the lineup when TJ Brody is clearly not at his best? And Sheldon Keefe tried to soften the blow and saying, We've thrown a lot at him. We've asked him to do more than ex- expected. At the same time, the guy's paying paid five million bucks, supposed to be a top yeah. four. You can't shelter a guy like that. And to me, no. I think that's the biggest issue the least faces. You can't shelter a TJ Brody. You need him at his best. And if he's not going to be at his best, someone else has an opportunity to show that they can be better. Um, we'll see if they have anyone on the roster that can step up and, and play the minutes uh, yeah. effectively that they need to, to do. Like, sure, I guess, like, yeah, you could have Edmondson play 20 minutes a night or you could, you know, end up having, uh, I don't know, I, I suppose Simone Benoit has played top four for majority of the season. He could go up and play 20 minutes a night come playoff time, but is he going to be as effective as what a a you know what TJ Brody has been the last couple of years, I don't know. I guess again we're we're gonna kind of have to see how things shake out uh, over the final dozen games here. Um, another thing that I keep you know that keeps kind of popping up here is is Ilya Samsonov and and some health concerns. I I saw uh, I was following along when he went down in practice, and then people were thinking that this was going to be like a season ending injury. And then, you know, Sheldon Keefe comes out and laughs about it. Oh, he's fine. He's good. And he plays and he's been all right. But then uh, left the game over the weekend with an injury uh, in the final couple of minutes. And again, Sheldon Keefe came out and said like, oh, he'll, he'll be okay. But you know, is, is there concern here? Like what's going on with, uh, with Samson? What happened there? Yeah. I mean, it was, I mean, for him to go down and not get up right away, and you look at the area that he was supposedly reaching for after he tried to make the save, didn't make the save. And we know the you know he he had that bit where he was taken out of the game. I like to me, he was so sharp in that game against Edmonton that if he had any sort of injury, it wasn't showing, right? Um, but yeah, you always have to be concerned when a goaltender has issues in the lower part of his body. Those are things that goaltenders can't fight through. They shouldn't be fighting through it. If they're impacted in their ability to move and be, you know, and their mobility and things like that, that's an issue. Now, they're not, they're being very vague. I can understand that. They're not, the Leafs aren't exactly always forthcoming with injuries unless it's apparent. Um, but I think it does say something when Sheldon Key says, yeah, he's fine, but he's not 100%. Yeah. Right. And to me, it's like, well, right now you're not in a position where you need to throw it. You don't need to throw stamps off in there. You have three goaltenders, right? Give way. Uh, so having Martin Jones back up, was it Saturday? Yes. He, he backed up. So like, didn't use Joseph Wall at all. I thought no. it was really smart, by the way, okay. knowing that they're going to throw Wall in there on Sunday. And then, oh, if something happens to Samson up, they don't have to veer away from that plan by having to throw a wall into the game, whether it's an injury or if he got lit up with a Christmas tree. You know, Martin Jones could go in and play that game. I thought that was a really smart thing uh, for Sheldon Keefe and, and the goaltending uh, department to kind of decide on on doing that to give Martin Jones, uh, like he's not a start, but allowed him to get, you know, sit on the bench. And he eventually got into the game. Um but just not use up Joseph Wall. I thought was kind of a smart way to uh, to utilize the three goalie system 
that the Maple Leafs have here. Um, what does this mean, though? And is the door now open a little bit for Joseph Wall? Because he ended up having a terrific game the following uh, night against the Carolina Hurricanes. Why don't we have that discussion on the other side and try and figure out what's going on with Mitch Marner and Callie Yarncroft? And is there reason to be concerned about those injuries as well? And we got a game tonight between the New Jersey Devils. We will tee that one up uh also so we'll do all of that when we return but first a word from our show sponsors today's show is brought to you by sleeper the season is coming to a close and regardless of where we are in the current standings i want to remind you that you can still win big by playing daily fantasy hockey on sleeper it's the official daily fantasy app of the Locked On NHL Network. Sleeper is our number one choice for daily fantasy sports, and especially daily fantasy hockey. Because of Sleeper, you can win 100 times your cash in daily fantasy hockey contests. All you got to do is pick whether studs like Crosby or McDavid or McKinnon. Uh, Ovi's been scoring the lights out. Uh, Matthews, obviously, and uh, whoever. Um, to record more or less than their sleeper projections for things like goals, assists, saves, plus, minus, and more in any given game. But to win 100 times your bet on sleeper, you need to correctly predict the outcome of eight player stats. You heard me, Lee fans. You can win 100 times your money playing daily fantasy hockey with sleeper. So start paying attention and nail your picks so you can start winning big. Use the promo code LOCKDOWNNHL. You'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. That's code locked on NHL. See sleeper terms of use for details and locational availability. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. It's Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti. We're a daily Maple Leaf Center podcast. You can find us five days a week on whichever platform you use to download your podcast audio wise and also up on YouTube to search up the Locked On Leafs podcast. You'll get new content from us each and every weekday monday through friday all season long and uh just the dozen games left of the regular season they've got the devils in town tonight we'll tee up that game in just a minute i presume joe wall will get the start uh in tonight's game i, I i'm still not sure what's going on with samsonov obviously but you know saying that he's not a hundred percent maybe he gets an extra couple of days rest and joe wall gets uh back-to-back -back starts um and is the door now open again for him to try and claw back into that uh, that starter's job conversation come game one of the playoffs here with the injury, but also the stellar play that he uh, gave the Leafs on Sunday? Yeah, I don't see why not. He, that was that game against the Hurricanes. The Leafs had no business being within a goal, mm -hmm. right? He even the goals he allowed. Were like I don't know what you expect him to do, right? And so to me, the power play goal literally just like went off his game. Yeah, like, it went off game. McCabe and just like it's yeah. he's going one way and the puck's going another way, and it's you don't you can't. There's not much you can do about that. And so for, for me, when you look at Joseph uh, Joseph Wall play, it's a different demeanor that he plays with. And and to me, I always say I wondered if coaches feel a different way when you see. A goalie like that play yeah. and yeah if he plays well over the stretch uh well over the stretch like do you see a situation where you know what he's got the momentum you ride that momentum and you know you saw what he did in the playoffs too it's not like yep. there isn't a, any sort of uh you know past history you can look at here he has played very solid granted the Leafs need to score a little bit more with him in net but I do think you need to get, he's also been off for so long. I feel like you got to give him a little bit of a little bit of a rope here so he can get his, get a little bit of a rhythm going. And with Samson on a hundred percent, no reason to throw Samson off in let Joseph will have a little bit of time. And then when Samson is back and ready to go, you can give him a couple of games just so he could be in somewhat of a rhythm too. Yeah. Um, I I'm with you. I think that's probably the way that I would go. Uh, and I think it totally means the door is open again for Joseph Wall to uh, to reclaim that number one uh, job here. So we'll we'll see what happens down the stretch, and and I'll be curious to see if he you know if he ends up with that start tonight. If Samsov can't go, I would imagine he would get it over uh, Martin Jones just because well he hasn't really played in a while either. Like he yeah, yeah he played the game against Carolina, 
but then didn't hadn't played in what like nine or ten games before that. Like it'd been a while since he had gotten uh, a game. So I, I think that it makes uh, a lot of sense for for that to kind of be the case going forward. Um, again, like I've been away for a little bit, so I'm not tracking it as deeply and closely as I typically am. But has there been any updates on on Mitch Marner or uh, or I guess Yarn Croc's not expected to to be around soon? Uh, but Labushkin's missed a couple of games here as well. Like, what what are some of the updates on on these guys? And I guess mainly like Marner, where it didn't seem bad. Like he was skating when I left, mm. he was skating. Right, like he was skating with the team, and it's an ankle sprain. So you would think, like, okay, if he can skate on it and practice, like, might be okay. Well, it's been over a week now, and he still is not even. You know, he didn't travel with the team when they went out on the road. So, like, what's going on with with Mitch Marner? Any updates there? Yeah. So first, I'll say Lubushkin's back. So he did come back against the Hurricanes after missing a few games in the illness. Marner, yeah, he skated, and then. Sheldon Keith said that hasn't responded really well, the ankle injury. So they're like, okay, let's give us some more time without the boot. And uh, Darren Drager was on the radio saying like, if this was the playoffs, he would have, he would be pushing more to get into the lineup. And yeah, we really just haven't heard or seen a lot of Mitch Martyr since. And so that makes me think that if we don't see him starting skating, you know, tomorrow or the next day they might give this a little bit more time ankle ankle sprains are tough like especially for hockey players because especially a high ankle like the high ankle yeah. is a lot worse than low ankle unfortunately yeah and for marner like he needs that he needs the mobility he needs the ability to be you know to make those cuts and stuff right and so and look his 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 absence has been felt right the inconsistent play of the top line max domi has done his best to kind of ride shotgun with Austin Matthews with Marner out, but the penalty kill, oh Dude, boy. The amount of money that I've been making fading the least penalty kill <laughs> over the last like week and a half, buddy, yeah. we're making big time. I'm, I'm like paying off student loans <laughs> with yeah. this. Like, yeah, it's been, th- it's been tough. Like when, when I do my best bets for, for covers.com, I'm consistently looking up power play points for the other side, just, thinking like okay well the Leafs since Marta's been out they, they've operated at like 60 percent like it's it's not good it, not good at all and if you look like Carolina scored Edmonton got a couple Washington scored like they, they're just allowing uh goal, a power play goal or two every single game here uh and yeah obviously both of those players Marner and Yarncroft are two big um two big pieces to that penalty kill like Connor Dewar, I'm sure, is doing his best. And I think I read in a piece today that since he's been acquired, um, outside of David Camp, he's had the most power uh, penalty kill time yeah. out there. And he's, you know, I, I think that he's a decent penalty killer. Uh, but, you know, Mitch Marner just brings a totally different, just makes a difference. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah. The Leafs have struggled really to clear the puck, get the puck out of the zone, and that's something Marner excels at. Yeah. Making the smart plays on the penalty kill, and yeah, Connor do du- like Connor Dewar's had to play a lot mm-hmm. um, because really the, the Leafs don't have anyone else you can really trust. Even Bobby McMahon's getting some time on the penalty kill. Pause his homework. I haven't been a fan of him on the penalty kill. Yeah, honestly, I don't think his game in the defensive zone is as highly regarded. Um, and it's That's- funny because go ahead. Well, I'm just like in general the penalty kill. Like that's something that really needs to get cleaned up because. Oh yeah. If you got a bad penalty kill in the playoffs, you're sunk. You're dead. You have no shot. No shot. So, I mean, it's one thing to have a, a struggling power play, but a penalty kill. Uh, that's that's you know Swiss cheese. That's bad news bears, man. I mean, if it's you're allowing be- one or two goals, like you're you're down a goal or two, you know, a puck drop almost. Right. Whereas if it's a bad power play, okay, it's not going to hurt you. But a bad penalty kill, that's that's a, a season ender in a seven game series. And it's happened too many times for this Leafs team, right? Yeah. They, against the Oilers, where it worked out better when they eventually were able to uh, avoid the full collapse was when Austin Matthews was out there with the net empty, getting a guy out there that can get the puck out of your own zone. They struggle so much at doing that. And to me, that's I, I guess I don't know if it's systems. I don't know if it's personnel. I'm sure personnel helps 
when you have a Mitch Marner out there, when you have a Kelly Yarncroke out there. But at the same time, you may have to go with different horses at some points, right? And, and get the guys that are going to get yourself out of that. That's why they put Willie on there. Um, obviously, he's not getting the first you know, first uh, chance out there on the pellet kill. But, yeah, no, the Leafs definitely, that's an area that I'm very, I'm still, if you got 12 games left, that's got to be your number one priority, in my opinion, to fix. Yeah. Yeah. You have to fix that penalty kill because that, to me, is what I think is going to be the difference of them being a contender and them being a first round exit. Like that's how concerning I think it is. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's something that's got to get uh, short up for sure. Um, outside of those kind of storylines, was there anything else that I I missed that kind of was uh, was worth talking about? I mean, we had the Zach Hyman reaching fifty goals. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, not a great little shot to the gonads there for any for everyone kind of reminding where what happened with the whole Zach Hyman situation. Um, yeah, yeah, like really, yeah. like, I forgot about the Zach Hyman situation. Oh, the one that got away, man. One, yeah. that, got one that got away, anyway. Um, yeah, no, like to me, like that's the, the Brody and goaltending and the have really kind of taken taken on like the big storylines. Mm-hmm. Uh, really, you know, ever since ever since you left, really, because that's really hasn't really been all that much else. You know, Bertuzzi was sick. Yeah, right. Like guys have been kind of in and out. You know, people were kind of up in arms about Benoit coming out in favor of Brody. Yeah, it, it's it's weird, man. Like I I, it feels like there's been a prolonged illness in the room. Like yeah. I think to, like the night Bobby McMahon came alive, that was due to illness. Like Marner and Tavares were 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 sick and couldn't play, and then like the next night it, you heard that there was even more players, and then uh, know, someone else got sick too. I I can't remember, but and then what? Now you got Bertuzzi who was sick this week, and Dubushka was sick. Dubushka was sick this week, and. You know, it seemed like Matthews during that little stretch when he got quiet, could have, he could have had something going through him. But it's weird that it's like it's been a month almost of, of guys popping up every now and then getting sick. Hopefully that gets, I don't know, cleared up in the playoffs. Like start pumping these guys with some, with some vitamins here. Let's, let's get some orange juice, Mojay to the fellas. You know what I'm saying? Um, anyways. Let's come back and let's kind of see where the Leafs are at with a dozen games to go. Where do they sit in the standings? Can they go up? Can they go down? Who are they likely to play? We'll get to all of that and more on the other side. It's Mike DiStefano with Dave Moore Studio listening to the Locked On Leafs podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Welcome back into the Locked On at Leafs podcast. It's Mike DiStefano and Dave more Sudi. Uh, we're still on a road to 5K. So we picked up uh, a couple dozen more follows or subscribers while I was away. So we got uh, like 190 or so left to go, 180 subscribers to go to get to 5,000. So we're trying to get there by the playoffs. And then we're going to be giving away a Leafs jersey. So make sure you sub up, tell all your friends to subscribe. Uh, and any of the 5,000 subscribers will be eligible to win themselves a Leafs jersey, courtesy of your friends here at Locked on Leafs. Uh, speaking of the playoffs and the Maple Leafs, um, as of now, Toronto currently sits third place in the Atlantic Division. It's where they've been for a majority of the season with a 40, 21, and 9 record, 89 points overall. Um, I don't, I, I'm not sure if I realized this before I left, but definitely I came back and I was just catching up to see what was going on with the standings, where the playoff races and all that. Toronto's only four points up on Tampa. Like that's not a large discrepancy here. Feels like at one point it was, I don't know, like eight to 10 points and they're pretty comfortably in third. And we're having that conversation before those, that the week, that they were playing like Buffalo or uh, Boston twice, and they played Buffalo. It's like, hey, Toronto, they win those Boston games. They're right there. They can compete with the Bruins for maybe home ice. Well, that clearly did not go very well. But now all of a sudden, a couple weeks later, it's like, man, they may not even finish. They may be a wild card team 
if they don't have a strong finish because Tampa's playing some good hockey now. And uh, there's only a four-point difference between the two. Toronto does have a game in hand, but they still play each other twice this year. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I was looking at they still got two games against one another. So if Tampa takes both of those games, ooh, I don't know, man. Like it's it's gonna get it's done. Feel, it's not a great feeling, that's for sure. Well, like Tampa's game, Tampa's been on a not, like a quiet roll. Yeah, and is that not the final game of the season? Like they got a back to back there in Florida. Yep. Are they in Florida, Tampa? Yeah, it's Florida than Tampa to end the season. Like that last game, game eighty two, could decide whether or not Toronto is a third place team and they're going to play the second place team in uh, in the Metro or in the uh, Atlantic, or it could be the difference between them falling out into a wild card spot and, and maybe a crossover where they got to play the number one team in the Atlantic division. So it's really interesting now where the Leafs kind of sit. And uh, I think that's why it's like, okay, we, we you know, you spent a couple weeks after the deadline playing with your lines and trying to see and get guys going, but Dog, we gotta get some. Gotta get some win. The thing is, they are winning games. Actually, it's not like they've, you know, been they've been bad. playing like a lot of like almost like five hundred though. Like they haven't gone on like t- like Tampa's on a seven two one run. The Leafs are five four and one. Yeah, and the Leafs don't have a lot of gimme games. Like I think the teams that they don't they play that are kind of lower in the standings between on the end is like Montreal, Pittsburgh kind of it like you got the the devils a couple of times they're not an easy out right you got the red wings you got the panthers you got the lightning really just not it's not an easy schedule for the leafs and so that's to me, that was kind of my thinking too like i looked at the standings i'm like how did tampa get that close again it's not not <laughs> not a great feeling and look and the other thing too is well, you hey, don't tampa- even know you don't know who's going to finish first in either division Metro and, and Atlantic are no, so No, that's close. what I was going to say. The entire playoffs picture right now is is completely up in the air. Like, even if you cross over, you don't know if you're going to play Carolina or you're going to play the Rangers, right? Like, you have no idea. And if you stay in third, you have no idea if you're going to play, you know, the, the, the Panthers or the Bruins. Or even if you drop down into, you know, the second wild card spot, you don't know who's going to have the better record out of the first place team in the Metro and the first place team in the Atlantic. Like there is every single playoff scenario is still very much available. Like no one is set in stone. Nobody is set in stone. Um, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. I think I could like, we have seven teams who are going to make the playoffs. I think uh, Washington is the one team they'll try obviously in the East. And uh, they've got the Islanders and Detroit on their heels. I, I I doubt we've got anyone else who really can get close. Like, I don't know, the Devils didn't win enough games, and, you know, the, the Sabres lost a couple. I think it's a three-horse race now for that final spot. But it's wild, man, how legitimately nothing is set in stone and there's 12 games to go. Just goes to show the parity in the league, which is a good thing, in my opinion, because last couple of years it's kind of been pretty cut and dry pretty early in the season that you knew exactly what – certain playoff matchups were going to be well especially the east so wide open and like the west obviously there's like there's a couple of races there to keep an eye on but that east like i think even like first like the president trophy race there's like seven or eight teams vying for the president trophy never yes. very very far cry from the bruins just cakewalking to the president trophy last year now a team's gonna whoever gets it will earn it and maybe not even want it like i don't you take it i don't want it i don't want the president's trophy curse seven teams seven teams are within one point of each other right now when it comes to the president's trophy i don't think i've ever i don't remember the last time i've ever seen that that's insane you've got legitimately the canucks right now and they're playing as we record i think they're trailing three to two in the third to la so they'll probably drop in terms of points percentage but right now, they are leading the President's Trophy race with 98 points in 71 games uh, with a 690 points percentage. So that 98 points, and then the Boston Bruins are in seventh place with quotes with 97 points. There's literally seven teams that have 97 or 98 points. Like, it's it's wild. Any one of these teams in the top seven could win one game, one game, and bolt themselves 
into the uh, into the lead for the President's Trophy. It's it's quite amazing. And like they're all winning. Like all of these teams are winning. You've got the Avalanche. They've won nine games in a row. The Canucks looks like they might lose tonight, but they had won you know a few in a row here. You got the Rangers who won a couple in a row. You got Dallas has won four in a row. Like it's they are really like everyone is is winning a lot of games here. The Hurricanes are eight one and one in their last ten games. Like everyone just keeps keeps winning hockey games, so no one's pulling away and no one's falling behind. It's it's gonna be a, a great race um, all around, I guess, in, in the entire NHL to see how things finish up in the last uh, month of the season. But if you could pick, Dave, if you could pick, do you have a lean as to who you would rather the least face in round one? Would it be Florida? Would it be Boston? Would it be the Rangers? Or would it be the Hurricanes? Because those are the those are the four the four choices. Like it's gonna be one of those four teams. Um do you have a lean? Nah, it's just like you're picking <laughs> you're picking your like favorite vegetable here. You don't like any of them, but you have to pick one. Um green beans. Big green yeah. beans. Asparagus. Asparagus. Uh, I could deal with some asparagus, but anyway. I'm to me, I would lean towards man, it's so tough. I probably lean to one of the Metro teams still, in my opinion. I think those Atlanta teams are just so tough. Like the Hurricanes, as good as they are, the Leafs have played them close and tough. Yeah. Oh, both of them been one point. I mean, the shootout game. Let's not even remind ourselves of that. But that's the team that I feel like the Leafs, as much as the ta- as Carolina plays that structured game, I think the Leafs better. They played them tougher. Even the Rangers, in a way, too. But I just like the Rangers have so much talent. Yeah, I would have wanted the Rangers. I- and the goaltending to me, like Frederick Harrison played out of his mind against yeah. the Leafs the other day. But I think the Leafs would have, would be better off going up against the Hurricanes. I just think they play them that much tighter. Yeah, I, I think I'm with you. I believe I'm with you. But also, I know that they lost to Boston this year. Like, they, they got swept. They <laughs> got their butts game. whooped by Boston this year. Yeah, I know. But, like, Carolina for sure I think would be the first team if I could pick. Um, because I, I like, they've got the weakest goaltender of, of the four, right? Like Bobrovsky, we saw what he did in the playoffs last year and he's having a good season. I mean, Jeremy Swayman has been unbelievable for Boston. And then Igor Shesterkin is getting back to, you know, being, uh, the arguably top goaltender in the world, the way that he's played in the last kind of two months here. Uh, so Carolina probably would be it for that reason. But man, that's a deep team. That's a well coached team. It's a structured team. I ultimately I don't like Toronto's chances against any of these four teams. Not to say that they can't win. I mean, hey, no one thought Florida was gonna upset Boston last year either, right? Nobody. And they ended up going to the Stanley Cup final. So it doesn't mean that Toronto can't win. Um, but they'll have their hands full with whoever the heck they have to play in round one. I don't <laughs> there's no easy answer. That's for sure. No easy answer. Uh, they're going to be the underdogs in any of these series. And uh, hopefully some of these issues that we talked about throughout the show can be solved by them. And uh, they'll, you know, try and solve some of them tonight. They've got the Devils. The Devils coming to town. Uh, and that's, that's a good team, right? It's a really good team who's having a tough year. Um, but, you know, how do you expect this one to kind of go down tonight? Yeah, this is a Devils team. I'm. I don't know if they're like one night they can blow out the Islanders, and then they lose to the Senators. Right? They've had some good and they've had some bad. I just think this is still a Devils team that's fast. They play fast. They got good studs. Their issue is goaltending. So if I'm the Leafs, you got to take advantage of the fact that their goaltending has been shaky, and you got to. You got to match their speed in some way. You got to be on top of them, especially like a guy like Jack Hughes. He's going to find himself some open areas and get some get, get some good looks. So with with Joseph Wall in that, I feel com- confident in the least ability to win the game. But it's all about the start. You got to get off to a good start, establish your game early, so the Devils are chasing the game rather than dictating the game. 
One hundred percent, buddy. And we'll see if they can uh, if they can get that done tonight. I do expect Joe Wall to be the starter as well. And uh, if I could give any advice to the Maple Leafs, just you know, fire pucks on net, man. Just fire as much pucks as you can on goal. They've had a tough time stopping those things all season long. Uh, although I think what Jake Allen's probably going to be the the starter tonight. I saw, or at least he's the projected starter. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we'll see what they've got. We'll see what they've got. But Toronto looking to get back into the win column and try and put a little bit more of a cushion between them and uh, Tampa Bay, who seems to be nipping at their heels uh, of late. So uh, go, Leafs, go. Hopefully uh, it's a good one. Excited for it. It's always a good matchup between the Leafs and Devils. Always a lot of fun. Lots of star power and firepower uh, for sure. So it'll be a good game. I'm excited for it. Uh, that'll do it for us here today on the podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On Leafs podcast on all podcasts and platforms and receive daily Leafs content by myself on X at Nikki underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morissuti. Follow, uh, follow along the show at Locked On Leafs. Uh, we'll be back with another episode for y'all tomorrow. But until then, keep it locked right here on Locked On Leafs.